Caitlin McConnell. Uh, I'm with Ozarks Alive, partnering with Missouri State University Libraries to do a, store, a study about truck driving along Route 66. We're here today with John Sellers, Executive Director of the History Museum on the Square, who's going to tell us some about what he remembers of truck driving along the historic mm -hmm. road. It was, uh, it was interesting. I was uh, very young. The, the minute I turned 18, uh, 1967, I uh, went down and got my chauffeur's license. Now, at that time, there wasn't a commercial driver's license or anything like that. If you got a chauffeur's license and passed the test, you could drive anything, big, little, whatever. And so it was all, you know, whatever you were game to try, you could, you could drive it. It wasn't truck driving schools on every corner and things like there are today. So um, I uh, got a job at uh, Colonial Bakery. And I was uh, working after school uh, when school was going on doing uh, what they call pull up. I would drive around town and freshen up the bread displays and do things like that. And then uh, uh, they had a driver on their relay routes. And a relay route was uh, they would leave the bakery here in Springfield and they would take a tractor trailer and go to other locations and load route trucks off of their tractor trailer so that they, so those route trucks could then leave and go out and deliver bread in that at that area, that local area. Uh, it saved a lot of time and a lot of trouble that way uh, because they didn't have to drive in Springfield and back. Mm -hmm. The bread was actually brought to them. That's why they call them a relay route. And one of the relay drivers was sick. Uh, they didn't have anybody else to take the truck. And so they uh, uh, they asked among us, the pull-up guys in the afternoon, did any of us know how to drive a, a truck? I said, yeah, I can drive anything. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, they said, well, come back at 8.30 and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll put you on the road. So I, I got back about 8, 8.15, 8.30, and, and they had a cardboard bread box uh, that the loaves of bread were in, and there was an insert in it so that it wouldn't crush. The, the loaves were still warm when they loaded into the boxes, so they didn't want to mash them down. So there was an insert that went in there that supported the weight of the next set of bread inside the box. And they had taken that insert out and they had drawn a crude map on it mm. of how to get to the service stations <laughs> where the bread trucks would park in the different towns on this route to Rolla and back. And they said, there you go, uh, there's your map, and uh, there's your truck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I left the bakery and uh, had some experience with a trailer behind a car because my dad had been a truck driver and, and he, his interest was that he wasn't going to allow anybody on the road that couldn't drive anything. Mm -hmm. So he had, he had instilled that in me, that uh, how to back a trailer and so on. And, uh, but not a 35 or 40 foot trailer. So I took off for Rolla. How, how, how big were the trucks you were driving around Springfield before? The oh, they were just little bread trucks, yeah. just a little delivery van. Yeah. yeah, no, it was just a dinky little truck. Mm. So <laughs> here I am in this tractor trailer uh, headed, for, uh, headed for Rolla, and I get out on the Glenstone and over the, over the bridge and, and out to Interstate 44. Well, at that time, the interstate was not completed. Uh, they were still working on the eastbound lanes of the interstate. So when you got past the uh, way station just outside Springfield at Stratford, the road veered off and actually connected with what had been old Route 66. Mm. So from just past Stratford to up past Lebanon, you drove on the old highway. But it was one way, oh. and but you never knew, because these old farmers would pull up there and go, well, you know, I'll head toward Springfield, and would be going the wrong. Way. You were forever meeting people going the wrong way, but it was that old curvy Route 66 mm -hmm. down through the valleys and up over the hills, and and then the westbound lanes of 44 were just straight as an arrow and super fast, so coming home was easy, but getting there was was a chore. And there were two or three different patches where they were working and, and revising what had been the original interstate, 
where you drove on that old that old Route 66 mm -hmm. highway. Um, it was uh, it was an interesting time. There were no radios in the trucks. You know, now everybody's got a CB or some kind of communication device or a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And you see most of the big over the road truck drivers will even have it like on a headset, like an airplane pilot. We had none of that. Uh, you communicated with uh, with flashing your lights mm -hmm. or or making hand signals out the out the window. Uh, if there was if you saw that they were running radar, you'd you'd reach your hand out the window flash your lights at the oncoming trucks and do like this <laughs> to let them know that there was radar ahead. Wow. And it, you, you, you learned to, you know, you acknowledged them uh, being, courtesy, being courteous and letting you by and you'd flash your lights and so on and so forth, just different signals. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was an adventurous time and it was, uh, it was exciting for a young teenage kid mm -hmm who felt 10 feet tall and bulletproof to be driving those big trucks. What, and, uh, what year was this? 1967. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I drove, I would drive I, I, different routes, but mainly to Rolla, because I'd, I'd drive from here to Lebanon, and there was two trucks parked at a service station in Lebanon, and I'd load those two route trucks off my big transport. And then I'd go on to St. Robert, and there was two trucks, and sometimes three in St. Robert, depending on what was going on at Fort Leonard Wood. Mm -hmm. And I'd load those, and then I'd go on to Rolla, and there was four and sometimes five trucks in Rolla. Mm -hmm. And I would load those trucks in Rolla, and then I'd pick up their stale and their empty boxes. The boxes, when they were done with them, they recycled them, used them over and over again. They were never sealed, they were just folded. And so you would, they would unfold them and lay them flat on a, on a pallet, and I'd load all the empty boxes on to be reused the next day or the day after, and that and the and the stale or the old bread, and I'd bring that all back to Springfield and then pull in and park, and then I'd kind of splash some water on my face and then go on to class, and uh, it was it was the pay was good, the people were wonderful, mm -hmm. and uh, the places along the road you you, you there was uh, just outside Lebanon there was a truck stop. And you think about a truck stop now with all the gas pumps and everything going on, and, and it looks like more like something from Las Vegas. The old truck stops were really, uh, uh, they were more homey. Mm. Great food. There was one called the Space Station. The Satellite Cafe was part of the Space Station truck stop uh, just outside Lebanon. That was a place I stopped. And then there was another one back towards Springfield on the way back. Uh, that I would always try to make too because they had a wonderful pie. And it was mm -hmm. called the Garbage Can. By Marshfield. Yeah. yeah, the Garbage Can was a great place uh, to pull off and, and get something to eat because mm -hmm. their pies were wonderful. Yeah, I've heard, I never, never got the chance to eat there, but I'm from, you know, from Marshfield and yeah. I've heard lots of really good things oh, about that yeah. place. <laughs> it, it was a one, and it was always full of trucks, mm. just always full of trucks. Did the trucks, did they tend to, would you have gone someplace because you saw other trucks there, or did you just chance it when you were trying new places? Uh, no, I'd usually go where, where, where there were other trucks, mm. yeah, and, uh, um, It was it was uh, a, a safe way to be sure where you where you'd eat, and then I talked to the other drivers. Uh, but you only had a certain amount of time because you had in the trucks. We worked for a big bakery company. Mm -hmm. uh, Colonial was a part of uh, the Campbell Taggart Bakeries, and and their company policy they had what was called a tachograph in the trucks, and and you didn't have the the speedometer cable that ran the speedometer. Uh, was unhooked and hooked onto this tachograph instead and inside this panel that had the speedometer on it was a uh, paper disc that was replaced every day that would show when the truck was running and not running and how fast you drove oh. because they didn't want you to, to speed. They wanted you to get done in a hurry but they didn't want you to speed and they also wanted to monitor that you weren't just goofing off mm -hmm. and you know padding your time. So uh, you, you really had to be careful because that talker at that tattletale was, was telling them how long you, you couldn't just sit in the truck stop. You had to get in, get something to eat, and get on the road if you didn't dawdle. You, you mentioned, you know, kind of the, I guess, camaraderie between mm -hmm. the truck drivers. And there was another guy I interviewed a while back who said that, you know, if a truck broke down, 
another truck would stop and help them. And Absolutely. was that kind of what you experienced Absolutely. too? Absolutely, yeah. And you, you'd pull out, you always had road flares and, and things like that. And uh, of course there was no other way for help, but you'd pull over and, and get a phone number to call, you know, because you had to go to a pay phone. Mm. You get a phone number to go to call somebody or whatever for them and try to get them back on the road. Or next town you stopped at, you'd go to the, there was always an all night uh, record service and you'd go to the record service and send them out. But uh, yeah, you had to. Like I said, there was no, there was no other form of communication. Mm -hmm. So you you had to pull over and help people. Did you break down very often on those routes? No, uh, surprisingly enough, I, I don't think I broke down once on the way to Sedai on a route mm -hmm. on a run. But I never broke down on the one to Rolla. The only thing that ever happened on the one to Rolla, <laughs> and it was the it was the craziest thing ever. Uh, we were, it was the 4th of July, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, the bread business, we were selling hamburger and hot dog buns like crazy people. And uh, so they added the, they had a driver on that run, and then they added another trailer load of nothing but hamburger and hot dog buns, mm -hmm. and, and gave it to me to run. But they didn't have another full-size trailer, so they had these old uh, we call them step frame trailers that w were not as high in the floor as a standard freight trailer like you see now. They actually sat down low to the ground and the wheels were up along either side of the of the floor. Mm. And then they had big skirts on the front of them where the dolly wheels were, where you'd dolly them down to, to unhook them from the tractor. And uh, this one had been sitting out back forever. And uh, they loaded me up with all these hamburger and hot dog buns, just piled them up, and then they put a tailboard on the back and put a tarp over it with more of them mm -hmm. so we could haul all of them. And took off, and I got to the scales, and I pulled across the scales. I had this little single axle tractor and this trailer, and I was overweight. Mm -hmm. And I called, they were, and it was so overweight, so ridiculously overweight, that they wouldn't let me go on. <laughs> <laughs> So I called into the shop and I said, uh, I'm up here at the, at the at Stratford and they won't let me go. They say I'm 1,300 some odd pounds overweight, whatever it was. And they said, it can't be, it's impossible. I've done the, the guy said, I did the math on the load, it's not there. I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. They're not gonna let me go. Here, talk to the guy. They just had him go. And uh, he said, no, I can't let him go on. It's, so he's too far over, overweight. That he couldn't unload enough off there to go on, and you'd have to come pick it all up. So uh, they let me turn around and come back into town. And they took, the, they didn't, they just didn't believe it. And they took it to the scales, and it scaled that weight. And they couldn't figure it out. And then they got to looking, and this old trailer was so old, and had been so just used, mm -hmm. that inside these big skirts on the side of the trailer up in the front was totally packed full of dirt oh. and asphalt and everything under the sun from years and years and years and years and years of using so they got a they got a spade and some and some uh, and the hose high pressure hose and started knocking all the mm. stuff up under the trailer and it was just it was just a ridiculous, practically a ton wow. of stuff that had built up under the front of this trailer. And uh, I, I just went, I told you. <laughs> 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 I didn't run the scale. But uh, that was the only time I ever had any kind of a, any kind of a problem. Pulled over and helped other people. But we, our shop, uh, we had an in-house shop and they maintained the trucks very, very well. We never had... Uh, we never had breakdowns to speak of. Did you have to go ahead and do that run again that night after they figured out what the problem was? Oh, they can't. We I came back and uh, they they didn't figure it out till the next day in daylight. Oh. I mean, this was an overnight deal, so they had to put it on uh, a bigger trailer. <clears throat> I can't remember how they did get it up there. I mean, my day was done, so it didn't matter to me. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, you had to keep a logbook, so you know I was out of hours. I was yeah. I'm done for the day. But um, that was the other thing that there the logbooks were were hard to keep track of because mm -hmm. it was so varied what what I was doing. It wasn't like I was running the same route every night. One time it'd be to Branson and. 
the Branson route was a big loop that you went to Branson and then you circled all across and went to Aurora and then came back. Mm -hmm. and then there was one to Sedea up through Bolivar, and then the one to Branson or one to, to Rolla. And uh, then there was one that went to Ava and just different loops that went out and came back a different way. Well, you know, off of that, you know, of course, today we all think of Route 66 as being this amazing kind of road all about in its own category. But back then, did it really feel like it was any different than any of the other routes you had to go? Oh, no. No, no, no. It was all, it, you know, when you pulled out on it, the music didn't start to play. Your hair, <laughs> did, your hair didn't start to ruffle. Uh, it was just another day at work. Yeah. And... Uh, I really, I, in all my life, traveling on that road, we would go to Oklahoma to visit relatives on the on the highway uh, when I was just a little kid. Uh, we got blown off the highway by a dust devil um, <laughs> on the way through Oklahoma once. It was just it was just a way to get somewhere, and it was convenient, and it was very scenic. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it, it was a highway. Yeah. I mean, so, we, you think of the, the neon and everything like we kind of mm -hmm. romanticize today. Did, did that even, did that even stand out? You know, that, that... Uh, there were places where it did, uh, going through Lebanon. Lebanon was all lit up and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, pretty bright. Uh, out on the north end of Springfield was going out of town. Um, No, not really. I mean, I, I just I didn't. People here, and I think this is part of the reason that Springfield has not embraced Route 66 and the significance of it till just recently, is because people here are are hardworking, utilitarian people. They, they have a job to do and a family to take care of it. And that was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the recreation piece of it didn't come about till much, much later. Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of jumping back to something you said before, but you know, it seems so weird to think about now that you didn't have a radio in the truck. You didn't have you know, music or anything to distract you, which mm -hmm. I guess back then you didn't think anything about, but what'd you do to pass the time? You just... Oh my gosh, you'd sing, you'd, uh, uh, you know, watch for certain types of vehicles. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, you know, it was like playing slug bug with yourself, you know. <laughs> you're just waiting to see some kind of oddity going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were, and as I said, it was kind of, it's kind of utilitarian. You were thinking about that next stop mm -hmm. and what you were going to have to do and what your orders were like and, and, uh, what kind of a mess you'd find their trucks in when you got to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it was just, yeah, it was just that way. You mm -hmm. didn't, and you know, later on, uh, you'd bring a radio with you. If you had a battery radio, you'd bring one with you. But, but the stations were so weak at night, mm -hmm. uh, unless you could catch a real good skip and catch, you know, WLS in Chicago or Wolfman Jack down along the Mexican border or somewhere like that, you didn't, there wasn't a lot of programming. The radio stations, most of them went off the air at midnight, mm -hmm. so. And then for you, like, how long did this trip take each night? I'd leave about 8 o'clock, and I'd get back in about 6.37 in the morning, and then... I usually had a 7.30 class. Wow. That, how did you, I don't know how you did that. I mean. You, you were, I was young and, and <laughs> it, I mean, today it'd kill me in about two days. But back then I, I didn't think it'd take much about it. Like I said, you just splash some water on yeah. your face and go to your first class. And, and then when I got out of class around 12 or 1 in the afternoon and go home and, and take a nap and, and uh, uh, jump up and get in the shower and do it again. Well, and you said kind of what you mentioned yesterday that at least at that point, truck driving was a very lucrative career. Oh my goodness, yes, 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 yes. I, uh, uh, I, I about doubled what my potential was to uh, as a school teacher mm -hmm. just right off the bat. I mean, I, I was making I was making great money, uh, uh, better than anybody 
anybody around you know, my age should have had a right to. And, uh, and the potential was limitless mm -hmm. as long as the work was there. And I got from that into to the marketing and management side of it and it just went on and on. And I never left route sales after that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I did, had other jobs, except part-time or second jobs, but as for the rest of my career it was all in route sales mm -hmm. because the, it paid well and it was fun and, and you got to see a lot of territory. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, back thinking to your 18-year-old self when you started this, do you remember that first day? Was it, were you nervous? Like, how nervous were you having to figure this out? Or was By it the time I got out of Springfield, I was soaking wet. <laughs> I mean, like you turned the hose on me. It was, it was, uh, it was scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew enough to be afraid, which probably helped me be as safe as I was. Yeah. Knock on wood, I, I was... I, I had a very, um, very safe career driving mm -hmm. a truck uh, and, and being around vehicles uh, for most of my career. I was, I was very lucky and very, um, very lucky for that and very lucky to be around a bunch of people that uh, meant a lot to me and still mm -hmm. do. How long did you do that, The, the what you started with, where you went to Rollin back? Uh, did that for just over a year, and then I left there and went to, uh, uh, went to Foremost Dairies, and then uh, uh, left that and went to, uh, by then I was 21, and I went to a place called House of O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became sales manager for House of O'Brien, which was a beer distributor. And uh, went from there to, to uh, work for a short time in retail, and then went back to route sales. Mm -hmm. I was a marketing director for Brown Derby stores for just a short time, and then went back to, went to work for Coca-Cola. And uh, was in the soft drink business then for 26 years. It really did open a lot of doors for you then. Oh, it did. <laughs> it did. It was amazing and met wonderful people. Uh, just, uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful people. You know, um, looking back at all of that, I guess primarily the, the first part that involved about 66 the most, but um, what, do you have a favorite memory or any story that sticks out with you? Um, oh, tons of them. Um, Hmm. Trying to think of what would be a favorite story. Um, no, really, they were all they were all good. I mean, there were there were bizarre, bizarre, interesting things. Driving down a highway one day up, uh, toward Clinton, and all of a sudden, I there were all these military police cars flying the other way and then there's this huge truck and uh, they were emptying out the missile silos oh. and there's a there's this nuclear missile coming down the highway wow. going the other way and I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but just you know this stuff like that happened all the time <laughs> it's too bad you didn't have a phone to take a picture I of know it. well no yeah and I, we, we, there are several of us that, that get together every month and, and play cards and do things. And we, we've had that conversation on many occasions. There's good news, bad news in, in our growing up time and our young careers where it would have been wonderful to have a phone, but oh Lord, I'm glad there weren't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 20, 30 years from now, some of these young people are going to wish that many of their uh, many of their activities had been documented so well. <laughs> well I guess I'll one last question unless there's anything else you want to add when you drive the route today does it feel like it did back when you drove it back then or is your perce perception or just does it revert I, you I, back I, I, the things that I that I find troubling and the things that I do when I travel is I try my best to avoid the interstate. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I like going to the little towns. Mm -hmm. uh, the interstate has made our country so homogenous. I like variety. I like to see what the real character and temper and tone and 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 local things are. Mm -hmm. I, I don't eat in chain restaurants. I don't I don't like to be around. You know, if I wanted to go to to a chain fast food place, I could go to that here. Mm -hmm. I want to go someplace different. I want to I want to see what the local oddities are, mm -hmm. and that just that just means the world to me. And so when we travel, and thank God my wife's the same way. Mm -hmm. We we load up in the truck and we go and and we're uh, we're there to see that piece of the country, not just another big slab of concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, it means it means the world to us, and I wish more people would do that. Just slow down, mm -hmm. just slow down, and stop and 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 sample what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. It'd mean the world to a lot of people that that have terrible preconceived notions of what's out there. Very well said. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? No, I All think right. that's that's a plenty. All right. Well, thank you very much for Anytime. helping us with this. Anytime.